Well, thank you very much. Um, and it is really a pleasure to be here. I've been excited about this since we planned it last fall. And uh, the moment has come. So I'm really, really delighted. Um, a disclaimer, I often, before I have like a difficult meeting or mediation coming up the next day, I have an anxiety dream. And I did have one last night. I was driving an 18-wheeler, which is actually something I've always wanted to do but never have, over a, pot, a huge mountain of gravel. And I was just grinding and trying to shift. And Anyway, so if I, if I if I shift during the next hour, you'll know you'll know that I'm moving my 18-wheeler forward. Um, so indeed, as Michelle said, I'm a mediator, facilitator. I focus on natural resource issues, public policy issues, uh, and I often work with tribes. I lived for um, almost eight years in Navajo country when I was um, a young adult, and that was a wonderful formative experience for me. I actually wrote a memoir about it, a cross-cultural memoir that uh, would make you laugh and, and perhaps uh, shed a tear every now and then about those years uh, in Chinle, Arizona, uh, Canyon de Chez, and that's um, King's English is handling that for me too. And then just in July, I uh, published, um, Island Press published my second book, uh, Common Ground on Hostile Turf, Stories from an Environmental Mediator. So, and that includes uh, stories from practice, from the trenches. So it's really interesting for me in academia, and I really appreciate it. I have no graduate degree. I have a, a BA in modern English and French history and literature, <laughs> which, which was fun at the time, but <laughs> kind of went nowhere. Uh, and so it's, it's really um, uh, very exciting and stimulating for me to be in an academic setting, to be with students. I enjoyed Professors Hol Holbrook's uh, class yesterday uh, very much, so, uh, so I'm, I'm glad to be here. I wanted to start with a, a memory that I have uh, from the early days of my practice. I was, I was facilitating a meeting for the Ford Foundation in northern New Mexico. The foundation really wanted to help resolve some water disputes uh, that were involving traditional communities and tribes and the state and adjudication processes and all. It was really, it is still quite a mess. The Ford Foundation convened all kinds of stakeholders, including Pueblo leadership uh, from that part of the state, um, small time irrigators and um, state officials, federal officials, etc. And I was facilitating to try to help people kind of come up with some uh, a picture of the, land, of the water landscape for the Ford Foundation, so to educate them so they could better make their grants. And at one point, we were talking about beneficial uses of water. And in New Mexico, they are really limited. It's municipal, industrial, domestic, and recreation, and state conservation. And that is it. So a Pueblo leader named Gerald Naylor raised his hand. Uh, and he's from Picaris Pueblo, which is the tiniest of all Pueblos and a tributary uh, south of Taos, tributary to the Rio Grande. And he said that he didn't think that list of beneficial uses was adequate at all. And in fact, he thought that the river, that, that any river should have a water right of its own. So I was early in my career and I was struggling to understand and hear him and be able to make sure everybody else understood him. And so I said, well, you know, do you mean so that you, you know, you can have water to fish in or, you know, something like that or perhaps uh, um, certain ceremonies at different times of the year? No, no, he said. I want the water, I want the river to have its own water. Well, do you mean like in-stream flow? Because environmentalists have been talking about in-stream flow and, you know, the importance for riparian habitat and no, no, he said, I just think the water, that there should be a beneficial use for the water to be in the stream. I want to know that the water is there. I said, oh, so you can listen to it out your window or so you can gaze, gaze at the water going by down below. No, <laughs> he was getting frustrated. I don't care if I never see the river. I just want to know it's got its water in it. And that was a really important uh, thing for me to hear. It taught me, uh, taught me to listen to what somebody's saying in a way and pursue it so that I can really understand what it is that's being said instead of kind of writing it off in my own language. Oh yeah, in-stream flow, I've heard of that. Okay, let's move on. 
so that was one thing I learned. And the other was that, that I need anybody in the position of resolving conflict or being in a conflict with others really needs to um, uh, listen carefully to all the voices that are there. And in the case of Gerald, he was actually expressing a voice for the river that was not there. So there are voices that are even out of the room that we need to pay attention to. And I have I have done that um, throughout my career when when important, when, when I felt that it was important. So um, that really brings me to a, a crux of what I want to talk about, and that is the importance of listening to what somebody has to say in a deep and meaningful way. And kind of ridding yourself of your own chatter in your head, your own defensiveness, your own struggle to master it all, uh, whatever it is, if, if I as a mediator or you as a conflict resolver, attorney or person involved in a conflict can simply take some deep breaths, relax and listen and let what's being said flood into you, it can make a huge difference. I don't think that conflicts can be resolved until that happens. I, and what I do for a living is mediate, facilitate very complex uh, uh, issues. Endangered species, um, regulatory negotiations for air quality, um, water rights disputes, uh, is situations that go on often for two, three, even four years with multiple parties at the table, maybe 12, 15, even 20 different interests at the table that need to be dealt with, that need to have that space created where they can talk honestly and creatively with each other. That's the ideal. It doesn't, <laughs> there certainly are, is a roller coaster ride uh, as we go through those processes. But so, so on the one hand, what I do is extremely complex and complicated. It's just like juggling a whole lot of balls in the air. On the other hand, what I've learned uh, more and more every year is the simplicity of it and the basic, basic human connection that needs to happen. Uh, so I would like to, is my mic okay? I know when I turn my head something else happens, but it's okay? All right, <laughs> okay. <laughs> my mouth gets closer to the mic, aha. Uh -huh. You're technological whiz over there. Um, so I, I, you know, I, th I was thinking recently why I, uh, why I really love the work I do. I could be retired and people sometimes say, when are you going to do that? <laughs> I don't want to. It's, uh, it's extremely gratifying and fun to do what I do. And I used to think, well, it's because it's about natural resources and, and how decisions are made. And I really care that the decisions be made well and um, and sensibly and with a lot of good evidence and that everybody is satisfied with those substantive decisions about the environment. And then I was uh, driving to Albuquerque a few weeks ago and listening to NPR on the radio and there was a program about AWE, A-W-E, and somebody had done a study and had interviewed people all over the country about where, moments when they felt awe. And people, I was really interested, and people said, oh gosh, the night sky when it's really dark and the stars are popping out at you, it's just awesome. It just fills me with awe. Or when I scuba dive, somebody else said, and down in the deep and I see all those creatures and I just understand the wondrousness of the planet, I'm filled with awe. I, I look at a butterfly wing under a microscope and I was filled with awe. And I kept thinking, well, when is somebody going to say something about people? Uh, don't, don't people fill you with awe? Because I, it clicked for me that what fills me with awe is people. And is when I am working to see a variety of people, often adversaries, come together in a room. Perhaps it's a big public meeting. Perhaps it's a small, smaller group of stakeholders. They're coming in. They are giving of themselves. They are passionate. They are committed to what they believe in. I don't care what it is. Um, they are willing to sit down with the other side. They're willing to take a chance, take a risk. They're willing to maybe even lose. They must have some shred of optimism that it's worth it to try to come together and, and work something out. 
And at the end sometimes of one of these days, I am so filled with awe that when I say to people, well, thank you, thank you so much, you know, this was a good productive day and uh, we'll see you, you know, next month when we have our meeting or, or whatever it is, I start to tear up. I just, I can tear up right now <laughs> thinking about it. <laughs> you know, I'm just so moved and so filled with awe for, for what people are willing to, uh, willing to give to each other and give of themselves. And so what, at those moments, then I have to fuss with my papers and so that they don't see that I'm really grabbing for a Kleenex. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, that, that's just uh, kind of the heart of, of what I do and why I care so much about what I do. Um, how to get people to that point where they are coming together in that way and sharing with each other some... Uh, some real um, information and real um, uh, feelings about what their needs are in this particular conflict, uh, I would like to talk a bit about. And I really think that in my experience, one of the best vehicles to get people there is the story. So I am now going to proceed, and I am like so, I just mastered, I didn't even master, but I just tried out PowerPoint a few months ago. I had like, you know, withheld. And you will see that this is not like other PowerPoints because I couldn't do it. Um, so anyway, there, that's a good start. Okay. So a story. So um, I am going to tell you a story about a story. And this is what you need to know about that story. Uh, the National Association of Counties, called NACO, uh, was challenged by some of their members. NACO is a representative organization of every county official, elected county official in the country, clerks, sheriffs, county commissioners, etc. And at some point in the early 90s, uh, some of the officials from some of the western states got together and said, this is just too difficult to deal with tribal lands within our county borders. It's not fair. There are taxation issues. There are law enforcement issues. We have to provide services. And yet we don't get the benefit of the resources on the reservation. And it's enough already. Just, just get rid of those treaties. It's time for Indians to grow up and join the rest of us. And uh, uh, so they went to NACO. And they said, you're our representative organization, so make it happen. Uh, you know, go to Congress and let's just be done with these treaties. Just to let you know that there were, there, those extremists that exist today were there <laughs> alive and well then. Um, so the NACO uh, decided to form a task force. What else would you do? Uh, and they uh, selected six Indian members of NACO, in other words, elected county officials who also were tribal members because that's possible, and six non-Indians, and uh, put them into a task force. That task force met for nine months with the goal of coming up with some sort of recommendations about how to reconcile this huge conflict, because obviously the Indian members of NACO were like, do not touch our treaty. They had nine months with no progress, and then I was called in as a facilitator for the final meeting one month before they were to go, give their report to the convention, NACO convention. Uh, and so, this, this is, you will see why this PowerPoint is different from others. Um, this is my graphic depiction of that day. When I walked into the room, there I am down there holding my arms up, and there are the 12 members of the uh, task force around me in a U-shaped table, all right? So um, the question is, Indian treaties, do we keep them? Do we dump them? I'm looking at these people. As I drove up to Denver from Santa Fe for this meeting, I thought, um, and this is kind of early in my career, I thought, well, gosh, this is really hard. I'd read all the minutes of their meetings, and they were just locked in this terrible conflict, uh, lambasting each other uh, and obviously not listening to each other about the sacredness of treaties and tribal sovereignty about the woes of trying to run a county that had a tribe inside of it, uh, just hopeless. I thought when I got there, well, I will have them introduce themselves. They all know each other. And so I said this. I said, I, introdu I introduced myself a bit and then explained who I was and that I really hoped I could help them out. And then I um, moved to the first person there on my left. And I said, so, so please feel free to um, 
in introduce yourself uh, and you know tell me what you would like to tell me about you so I have a better feel for for uh, who's in the group and then we can proceed with with our work at hand so the first person said I'm Joe Miller and I'm from Boise Idaho and I'm the county sheriff period okay thank you Joe good to have you here I moved to the next one and she said I'm Elaine Summers and I'm from Sammamish in Washington State. I've been the county clerk for 12 years. I really enjoy my job, period. I thought, oh no, I've got no time to kind of get my act together. I'm not getting th anything out of this group. Uh, I'm gonna, we're gonna be done in about 12 minutes and I'm gonna have to uh, be ready to move on. And so I was kind of struggling with that, but I needn't have worried. The next person was um, Louise Yellowhair and I said, please introduce yourself. And she settled back in her chair. She was a middle-aged Navajo woman. And she said, I'm Louise Yellowhair. And I was born in a Hogan. Do you know what a Hogan is? She looked around the table. And people went, no, I don't know. She said, well, a Hogan is a traditional Navajo house. And it, the door has to face to the east. And you build it with logs. And it has eight sides. And I was born in my grandmother's Hogan. And the reason I was born there was that my mother was a very serious alcoholic. It was awfully sad, and she was in jail a lot of times. So my grandparents raised me, and I was really lucky, and um, I had to herd sheep. She says, I w we, our Hogan was just outside Tuba City, Arizona. And then she looks, you know, do you know where Tuba City, Arizona is? No, they don't. Well, if you were in Phoenix, and then you drove to Flagstaff, and if you kept going north from Flagstaff, you would run into Tuba City. And our Hogan, don't turn to the right. The main road goes to the right. Turn to the left, and if you go about four miles on a dirt road, that's where the Hogan was. Well, now she's giving us all kinds of detail. And I'm looking at my watch, and it's about, you know, seven minutes have gone by, and she still is born in the Hogan. <laughs> and I'm thinking, hmm, you know, should I worry about how much time this is taking? She told us about herding sheep. She told us about her very favorite sheep dog named Rusty. He was red, a most beautiful red color. When the sun shone on him, oh, it was the most beautiful, beautiful color you've ever seen. And one time when she was out herding sheep, the coyotes tried to attack her dog Rusty, and she had to run up with a stick and hit the coyotes so that they would run away. And it was really a scary moment for her. And then she went to high school. She was the only one in her family to go to high school. She graduated, it was a very exciting moment. Then she got married, she had four children, probably too quickly. Her husband was a wonderful, wonderful man. He went to work on the railroad. I'm looking at my watch, it's like 15 minutes have gone by and she's about 21 years old and she's got a few more decades to fill us in on. And I'm multiplying the rest of the people at the table by 15 and I'm thinking, yipes, this is gonna be like three hours of introductions. What am I gonna do? So I looked around at the rest of the folks around the table to see if, as sometimes happens, I will get a, a, a signal for, from somebody going, you know, cut her off or looking at their watch, excuse me, you know, what kind of facilitator are you to not be keeping time here and move things along? We have a large agenda. So I thought, am I gonna see any of those signals? I didn't. People were mesmerized by Louise's story. They were just absolutely enthralled. So I let her go on. She got a call one night. Her husband had been killed on the radio. It was a, on the radio, excuse me, on the railroad. It was a terrible tragedy and, um, she, there she was left with four small children, and she decided to go back to go to school, go to college. She got an associate's degree in alcoholism counseling that was so meaningful to her. Eventually, her children grew up to be teenagers, and at that point, her sister-in-law said to her, Louise, you should run for the county commission. You would be really good, and there's no Navajo on the county commission in Coconino County, and you should do it. Oh! she said, me, I'm a little Navajo lady. No, I couldn't possibly do that. But they convinced her and she said, so she said, my, my teenage children and I got out there on the highway and we held up signs for me to vote for me. And on the road between Flagstaff and Tuba City, there are no cars anyway, but we had a good time holding the signs. And lo and behold, she says she was elected to the county commission. And 
she and now, you know, I've given up totally. It's like 20 minutes, 25 minutes, almost a half hour. Uh, she, uh, she then says, kind of takes a pause and she says, and the scariest thing for me in my whole life, and this is significant because we've just heard a lot of scary things in her life. <laughs> the scariest thing in my whole life was that night I had to go up there and sit in that county commissioner chair for the very first time. And she looked around at her group and she said, why are those chairs so big? Those big leather chairs that they have? And everybody kind of chuckled like, yeah, we've got those big leather chairs in our county too. She said, I don't know why they're so big, but I sure felt little when I sat in that chair. And when I went up there, my knees were just shaking. But she said, I've been a county commissioner now for 12 years and I really enjoy doing it, and I represent the Navajos, and even the white people, and even the Hopis, and she laughed, and she said, and so that's, she said, that's my story, and she was quite pleased with herself, uh, and I thanked her very much for it. I looked around again to check, take the temperature on the rest of the group, and there were some tears in eyes, and everybody was riveted to Louise, and really connected, I think, and grateful for her story. So we continued on around the room, and I thought, well, whatever happens is going to happen. I have no, you know, I can't, I can't now say to the next person, excuse me, it's been seven minutes, you really must move on. That wouldn't be fair. Anyway, it was a facilitator's dilemma. Uh, we continued around. People took the time that they needed to say something significant about themselves, something that would relate to why they were there, relate to each other. Uh, and when we got to the end, I went back to those first two people and said, you know, given given the nature of, of the introductions, would you like to add something more to your introductions? And those two did. And be, they added something um, personal and told a little bit more about themselves. At that point, it was time for lunch. We'd blown the entire morning on introductions. And I, uh, you know, I thought this is going to be tough. We've got three hours in the afternoon from one to four to resolve this really difficult problem. So I, uh, we went down, we had a wonderful lunch. Everyone was very cordial and a lot of good conversation happened. Went back upstairs and I said, uh, well, before we start to work on the issues that are significant in front of us, let me just ask how you felt about what happened this morning and how you think we should proceed, which I think is always actually a good technique, um, especially if you're sort of in doubt about where this group is going at any given moment, ask them. Ask them where they, where they, where how, what situation they're in now, and what they think should be done next. So one person said, one non-Indian person said, "Well, it's really clear after this morning that, um, you know, it, that every tribe is different and every county is different. So I'm not sure how NACO is going to have a single policy to cover all of these situations." And someone else said, an Indian said, I don't really know, I didn't really know how difficult it was for counties to deal with tribal lands within their borders. I mean, I've heard people be really angry about it, but I never really understood it. So it seems to me that we need to talk more about that. Somebody else said, this just needs to be handled on, a, on an individual basis. The county and the tribe that's having trouble, need they need to sit down, they need to talk it over and figure it out. Someone else said, we're not going to get rid of treaties. I can see that now, a non-Indian said. So that laid the, the foundation for a talk that afternoon uh, among everybody about what they were going to say to the, the conference, the annual meeting of NACO the next month. They came up with several excellent recommendations about uh, having some in their newsletter, having positive examples of what um, uh, of different resolutions of county and tribal conflicts. You could have some good news stories. Um, they also had a, a suggestion that maybe little SWAT teams could be created, even from the members of the task force, if a county and tribe were having trouble in some way, jurisdictional issues, whatever. Um, the, that those little SWAT teams could go out and and help out. Uh, and there were several other excellent suggestions. They adjourned um, feeling very satisfied and uh, with a certain degree of affection for each other, I think, and because of that deep knowledge that they had. Uh, what happened, they went 
to the convention and gave their report. And what happened, I am not sure. That's one of the problems with what I do. Once I've done what I do, I often don't get to follow up. So um, I certainly did not hear anything about the treaty um, uh, issue a after that. So I think that that was put to rest, which was the main point. But for me, Louise was a complete inspiration and model of what it takes to, to change a group. She single-handedly, with the with that story, with the courage to tell that story, to let down her defenses, to be vulnerable. She took a huge risk in front of people that had proved themselves to be her adversaries, and she was her authentic self. And that was extremely powerful, obviously, for everybody at the table. So, um, aha. so here, we have, I'm going to do another story that might be 20 minutes and, um, and then I, I'm not sure. I can either read a bit from my book or we can just open it up. I want to be sure we get time for questions. So I'll probably do that. Uh, and this, this story demonstrates the complexity of the cases that I work on, um, uh, the complexity of data, of politics, how it all comes together in a terrible way. And this, I had to put in there. If I knew uh, how PowerPoint could make that big forbidden sign, that big circle with the line through it, this, I woke up one morning a few weeks ago, and uh, this was in the morning paper, and I just had a fit. It ruined my day. This is not what I'm talking about. Louise would not like that picture. That is not good, collaborative, open, authentic communication. And uh, uh, it's uh, Senator, it's a, uh, Secretary of State John Kerry and the UN Secretary General Ban Ki Moon uh, at the Syrian at the, after the first day of the Syrian um, peace talks, and to me it just epitomized what I don't want to have happen. This, on the other hand, look at that. They look pretty um, engaged. Um, one person in the middle, who's from the Park Service, is speaking. On the left, we've got the um, the head of Grand Canyon Airlines. And on the right, we've got the Arizona Hikers Association. So this is a shot from the case I'm going to talk about. And here we go, my highly technical graphics. So this is the Grand Canyon, obviously, with the river running down the middle of it. And this is how it looked you know, a few hundred years ago, um, with uh, trees and birds and a couple of uh, uh, tribes, the Havasupai down in the bottom, the Hualapai up on the on the rim. Whoop! This is what it looks like today. We've got um, air tours, the helicopter and the fixed wing air, uh, air tours both. We've got uh, high flying commercial flyers over the over the Grand Canyon. We've got camping going on. We've got hotels and stores. We've got hikers, tourists, visitors, boaters going down the river. And over there, Wallapai has even built themselves that little horseshoe coming off the side. Their sky, I think it's called Skywalk, where you can like, it's a glass bottom walkway and you can walk out over the canyon. So, and a railroad. Um, so there's a lot going on at Grand Canyon today. Back in 1986, there was a terrible crash and 23 people were killed. Uh, a, um, I think it was a helicopter ran into a fixed wing plane and everybody aboard was killed, the tourists on the, and the pilot on, on both planes. Um, that, uh, Congress acts quick when they have to and when they think they should. And in 1987, they passed the National Parks Overflight Act of 1987. And they very quickly established safety uh, uh, standards for uh, air tours over national parks. And the FAA was instrumental in establishing those. They, they made certain routes. They set up flight-free zones where, you, um, where, they, where they didn't fly at all. They had altitude limits, which they hadn't had before. Um, and also part of that act was noise reduction. And this is where I come in. Uh, they were unable, the, the Park Service and the FAA had been unable since 1987 to figure out how to reduce the noise from air tours uh, and restore natural quiet at Grand Canyon. And there was enormous pressure from environmental community to, and the recreation community to 
you know, relieve us of this uh, um, air tour noise, this constant buzzing over the canyon. Uh, and of course, there was a very strong defense uh, by the by the air tour industry. You know, we uh, it's our American right to have small businesses, and in fact, there's a federal federal something or other, a federal regulation that says small business cannot be tampered with. They have a right to exist in in, in federal uh, parks and uh, recreation areas, and so you know, don't uh, don't mess with us. So the substantial restoration of natural quiet was what the two agencies, FAA and Park Service, needed to get out of this process that I helped design and then mediated for them. And they defined substantial restoration of natural quiet as 50% or, oops, sorry, or more of the park achieves natural quiet. In other words, no audible aircraft as opposed to noticeable aircraft. I, it, it got very complex. 75 to 100% of the day. Well, there had been lawsuits over the years to for all kinds of things to establish this. There was a lawsuit um, to establish the definition of the word day. Did it mean like 12 hours? You split it day and night. Did it mean sunrise to sunset? Just what was meant by the word day. So that's an example of how um, adversarial and picky this whole process was. So the Park Service and the FAA jointly together formed the Grand Canyon Overflights Working Group. And this is what I ended up mediating. Uh, they convened it in 2005 with that mission to develop those recommendations. We operated by consensus, and the consensus meant unanimity. And I think that's really significant. We had at the table, um, I think, 16 different parties. And of those parties, one was an environmental, two were environmental organizations, and one was a recreation organization. There were about five different air, six different air, air tour and airline representatives at the table. In other words, it was not evenly represented. So if you're not going to be voting, I mean, if you, if you feel you're in the minority, then you really need the decision making process to be by consensus so that if it's you, so that if the, so the decision has to be unanimous, and if that single um, representative, for instance, of one of the tribes, we had four tribes at the table, uh, chose not to give consensus, it would be blocked. The decision of the group would be blocked. That's that's how you can get away with having a single representative for each interest. Uh, the deep divides in the group were huge. Uh, the an environmental representative said he just had, you know, that for him it was about getting rid of, rid of the incessant noise of motorized man. I just love that phrase. Uh, on the air tour side, they said, you know, we can't, we've already mo budged a lot. We've moved a lot since 1987. We had to cut out all kinds of routes. We had to limit our altitude. You know, we're, in, we're already in the middle. Uh, don't ask us to move in the middle because we're already there. So this is what this is going to get messier and messier. This is what this is. These are the members of the Grand Canyon Working Group. Um, from left to right at the top there, we've got the Fish and Wildlife Service because there are endangered birds in the Grand Canyon. So they were uh, a stakeholder. We had General Aviation. Those are um, mom and pop folks flying around in their own little planes. We had commercial high flyers, the airlines, uh, American and United, going back and forth something like 400 flights at night and 800 flights during the day over Grand Canyon. Um, we had the helicopter air tour people and the fixed wing air tour people. Each had two representatives, one from Las Vegas, one from the Grand Canyon itself. Uh, we had four tribes, Havasupai, Hualapai, over on the right, Navajo Nation, and the Hopi tribe all had a claim to um, uh, an interest in in this issue of reducing air noise, uh, reducing noise over Grand Canyon. We had a hiker representative, we had a voter representative, um, environmental representatives, and then the FAA and the Park Service were actual members of the group at the table. So they too were going to offer consensus to whatever regulations could be um, developed by the group. This meant that if they were in agreement with those regulations, they would be promulgated, would be adopted by the two agencies. They agreed, 
you know, if we can all come to agreement, this very diverse group, that's a powerful thing, and we will assume that all the interests are being met, and we will, um, uh, and, and we ourselves will agree, FAA on their side, that these are safe regulations on the Park Service. This meets our mission as being stewards of the land. Um, and, and serving the visitors of the park. So, um, so that completeness of the group was, was really important. So I'm going to talk about the challenges, how it just got messier and messier. Bad history. Down at the bottom there, we've got uneasy co-leads. The FAA and the Park Service, because of their very different missions, were um, not um, uh, ha really talked past each other in terms of language a lot of the time. Their, their whole ethic, their, their approaches, their values were very different. And each had a feeling that the other, uh, that they were more valuable than the other. That it was really, FAA could be very um, superior about the importance of safety. It is all about safety and you can't tell us anything is more important than that. Well, that was hard to argue with, but the Park Service did. Uh, and, and, and we had, um, and so then we had the enviros and the hikers and the boaters against the um, air tour folks. And they had been battling uh, in court um, and in, in, in lobbying Congress for decade, for two decades. They'd been fighting with each other um, over this whole issue. The enviros obviously wanted to get rid of all air tours and um, just go back to the way it was in about 1850 would be really nice. That was not going to happen. Um, the air tours just didn't want to be messed with anymore. So it's very, um, very difficult. Outside pressures and temptations, and this is often the case in these, where these situations that go on for years, all kinds of things are going to happen in the outside world, elections and, and natural disasters, and etc. So up there in the purple, we've got the peanut gallery. The meetings were, this was arranged as a subset of a FACA, a Federal Advisory Committee, Committee Act, uh, group, and that meant it came under certain federal regulations about how that group had to be put together. And one of those regulations says it shall be open to the public. So although we had 16 people around the table at the meetings, we had as many as 60 or 70 observers, you know, in the peanut gallery that were sitting there listening to every word. Uh, the great majority of them were related to the air tour industry which put a huge pressure. On the one hand, it kind of gave support to the air tour folks at the table, but it also put a lot of pressure on them. They couldn't, whatever they said, somebody out there was going to be really angry and critical. You weren't tough enough, or you weren't this or that. Uh, why did you start with that? Why didn't you go this way? Yeah, I really felt sorry for them, There was, but there was um, nothing to do about it. What, what we did was offer a time during the day. Uh, uh, we had usually two or three day meetings and we'd offer a time before lunch and before we adjourned for the peanut gallery to stand up and have their say. And so that kind of kept them, they knew they were going to be able to express themselves. And then we had Congress up there, um, which was just about as bad as the peanut gallery. We had uh, Senator McCain, who cared desperately about this situation and uh, sent letters to this group every now and then kind of guiding them in one direction or another, often a direction we weren't headed in. It's kind of like, oh, what does he want? Oh, dear, we need to pay attention to him. Oh, um, so that was a, a complication. Complex data, reliance on the model, and a big surprise. So in order to achieve this definition of substantial restoration of natural quiet, to get those numbers and everything, the, the, um, the convening parties had to have a model to work from. We, we, how could we say, well, that one's too noisy. Well, that's not so bad. I think this is noisier than that. It's all done by a model. And the modelers took a year to produce the model. The group agreed in advance, when we, when, when we get our model, we will, we, will com we will completely go along with the numbers that it comes up with. And, the, and what it would come up with was an allocation showing this much noise comes from this source, this much from this kind of helicopter, this much, this much from, the, from the birds singing in the trees. We had ambient noise. It was very complex. So the model was done. They ran all the numbers. And up there on the right, after tons and tons of data, we have the result of the model is that 97% 
of the audible noise over Grand Canyon comes from the commercial high flyers. And I, I mean, it still is kind of confounding, but because of the numbers of flights and the constancy of that noise over Grand Canyon, they are the, by far the major contributors to air noise over Grand Canyon. This meant that you could wipe every air tour off the map and it wouldn't make any difference. They wouldn't help reach that goal at all. They were, they were off the hook. They just jumped for joy. I've never seen anybody look happier. It was like, whoa, it's not about us. You can't do it. You can't touch us. Uh, and it was just, it was a very bizarre moment. Um, we then pursued trying to control the um, commercial high flyers. We had the, um, Ameri uh, the uh, American Airlines Association or something like that come in to, uh, to talk to us. We said, well, couldn't we ha arrange it so that those high-flying commercial jets, when they come over Grand Canyon, they go like this. They just kind of, you know, oh, lordy, said, the, said these folks. No way. It's way too crowded. It's like, a, you know, mega lanes of highways headed across the country east to west and north to south. And if you made a bulge like that, it would cause chaos. We'd be in Canada. We'd be in Mexico. Oh, no, no. Cannot, you cannot touch our air traffic lane. And we found that we could not. We heard from Senator McCain about that. OK. Uh, tribal factions. So not only, of course, did each tribe have its own needs, but within each tribe, there were splits. Over there at Hualapai, you can imagine that some faction of the tribe built the Skywalk and was bringing in tourists um, hand over fist and was just happy to be making all the money they could possibly make. They even had their own air tour operation on Hualapai land. There were also traditional Hualapai who really thought that was a terrible idea and were trying to defeat their own leadership at the next election. So there was some flip-flopping back and forth. You couldn't exactly count on, on that seat at the table and what would be coming out of it. Um, the Havasupai, I didn't realize, but it's obvious, they need flights. They, they helicopter in and out. Um, like every Friday, all of the teachers and all the health professionals down in the bottom of Grand Canyon go to the bank by, by helicoptering up and going to the nearest town to go to the bank. Uh, so they are, you know, they couldn't say, oh no, we don't want to have any air noise because they're, they're dependent on it. Uh, um, that was interesting. Navajo Nation had a split between local, the local Navajo chapters. There are two of them right, right near the edge of the Grand Canyon. And one of them couldn't wait to have its own air tour business and uh, thought that was going to be really great and but their, their chapter would become rich. And the other one uh, said they just couldn't stand it when an air tour went over and the sheep ran in every direction and it took them hours to get everybody together again. They didn't want another air tour anywhere near them. The Hopi, uh, we came up with a certain route for the air tours that looked perfect, looked really, really good. And the Hopi said, oh, that is exactly on top of the sacred site where we go to get salt, you know, every year. And no, it, that we don't care where the air tours are, but not there. So it, it was challenging. Multiple parallel process, processes, too many bites at the apple. So one, one problem is that, that you want, if you've got a group together for three or four years, you want them to focus on being together and resolving this problem in this, in this forum. You don't want them running off to Congress or, or to the courts. In fact, we had to agree we, they would not sue each other during this period. Uh, but there were parallel processes by law that had to be going on at the same time. And that meant that some at the table could say, well, I don't really, it doesn't matter what I say at this table here, in this collaborative table, because um, the NEPA, National Environmental Policy Act, and the EIS process, I can, I'll participate there, I'll have a stronger voice. Or the tribes could say, well, we're, you have to do government to government tribal consultations with each sovereign government. You're going to have to do that about these air noise regulations. So, uh, so we'll just, we'll wait for that. Uh, and then the same with the endangered species, fish and wildlife. A uh, person at the table was very silent, non-participatory for the whole time, and I believe he was just waiting till he would have his Section 7 endangered species consultation with the, uh, the Park Service and the FAA. 
Uh, finally, failure of consensus. At our last meeting, we came up with 23 separate recommendations. What had happened was when the when the when the um, onus fell on the commercial high flyers, and we found that we couldn't do anything about it, we could have just abandoned our mission. We really could not do what we were supposed to do. But the two agencies decided that it would really be useful since this group had been together for a while and so much information had been gathered, that it would be useful to have them at least talk about ways to reduce air tour noise. Now the air tour guys, you know, they, they could be nothing but generous if they, if they agreed to anything. They didn't have to agree to anything. But they were in a benevolent mood. And, um, and so they said, yeah, we'll sit down and we'll see what can be done. Obviously, if it was in their interest, they would do it. And there might be some overlapping interest. So in fact, we found 23 recommendations. The first was the most important one, seasonal shift in routes, so that somebody that was going to hike uh, at the Grand Canyon would know in advance that in a certain season, this is the area that's going to be noisy, and they could go over here and have guaranteed silence, or the reverse. So if you cared a lot about a certain part of the Grand Canyon, you could go there uh, if you picked your season and find it to be free of air tours. Um, and there were other things about uh, introducing quiet technology. It's kind of funny to think of quiet technology for a helicopter, but there is such a thing. There are actually quiet technology engines, and so phasing those in was one of the recommendations. Education and signage, times of day for the, for the uh, air tours. We thought consensus. Again, it had to be unanimous. We went around the table. And we failed when we got to the envir to an environmental representative. And she said that um, she could not agree to these recommendations. We then tried to go one by one. How about the seasonal shift? Because that was the most important to everybody. And she said, no, she could not, uh, she could not give consensus. So what was going, she had not given a sign of that uh, as we were developing all the recommendations. Um, you know, what, what was going on? I have heard from, you know, over the years from the environmental camp and for other interests as well, but particularly from environmentalists that this kind of process is sort of threatening. It, 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 they're, they're just not sure what's in it for them. Um, they assume in the first place that it's stacked against them, that uh, they're going to end up in a room with people that are exploiting the resources, like the air tour guys and that the agencies are, are choosing this way of doing business because they're weak. And if they would just get out there and enforce um, uh, the law, um, uh, there wouldn't be a problem. So that, that can be a, um, a, an environmentalist view of these processes. They often think that, that it's a stalling tactic and they don't have time to waste. For them, it's urgent to get this resolved, to get uh, the environment protected. Um, they're afraid that once they get into one of these processes and promise to participate as a good participant, then they're not allowed to sue, they're not allowed to pursue these other avenues that really might be um, more productive for them. Uh, and, and then finally, they, they fear that the agency is just kind of hiding, uh, hiding behind this process. And if they really stood up on their hind legs and did what they were supposed to do, um, it would be better. Uh, so the epilogue of the Grand Canyon, um, uh, there were, you know, there were achievements. There were really good working relationships that were uh, shared among people. Uh, everybody certainly understood positions and needs by the time it was over. The decision makers, the FAA and the Park Service, were actually very appreciative of everything that had been done. They took the recommendations and they made them a foundation of the air tour management plan. However, there still are disputes about that definition of the substantial restoration of natural quiet. Um, and, uh, and really, the only significant thing that has happened since 2009, uh, when this ended, is the adoption of quiet technology um, for most of the uh, tour companies. Um, so, oh, there are those damn guys again. <laughs> But that's the one I wanted to show. 
That's the Grand Canyon Airlines uh, guy who was very reluctant to get into this process in the first place. Uh, and me in my younger days, that's at, uh, at the end of one of our meetings. So um, that is the end of the Grand Canyon story, and um, I, I hope that it's been um, enjoyable and instructive and that, uh, that the power of stories is made real to all of you, and I would love to take some questions. I think we probably need to get out by 25 after, or will people start to come in? Okay. So we have 10 minutes or so for any questions or provocative statements, or I'll take it all. Yeah. How do you mediate the yes, no argument and also the just one? So if you're calling to a place called Alton, Utah, which is very close to Bryce County, the calling to a people who are in law clearly allows them to go and stand at the BLM area in the environment and say, no, not never. You don't. You don't. You can't. You could bring them together so that it's clear where everybody stands, um, uh, but there is a decision that's going to be made either yes or no. Now, if there was something about the development that could, you know, if if the environmentalists felt that that, that you know, mining half of the coal field would be acceptable but not the other half for some reason, then there, you might have something to work with. If the mining company said we could do it um, in 20 years instead of doing it right now, if there was something to play with, uh, you could mediate. But if it is to mine or not to mine, um, you, I, I couldn't, I wouldn't have anything to offer. There, there is an example uh, in at Mount Taylor in New Mexico. The a uranium company is proposing a new uh, uranium mine on Mount Taylor. There have been several in the past uh, that have been, one is a super fun site, it has not been a good experience, and now because of the price of uranium, uh, there's a plan and their permits have been applied for. And because of the 1872 Mining Act, the mining company says, and apparently it's true, you cannot stop us. Where you, you can, you know, you can modify the permit, you can put uh, conditions on it, you can, there'll be remediation that we have to do, but you cannot stop us from mining. There, there are five tribes in the area, all of whom consider Mount Taylor sacred. Mount Taylor is actually designated a traditional cultural property, the whole mountain, and that is not enough to, um, to stop the, mi the mining from happening if they decide economically it's feasible to go ahead and mine. But I am um, uh, mediating a process to develop the, the, uh, the, um, the permit conditions and the requirements for remediation. And it's very painful because, as you say, that fundamental yes-no issue is not on the table. So every time the tribe speaks uh, about, you know, we really need you to avoid this particular sacred site, they have to preface it by saying, just because we're here at the table, sitting down with the company and with the Forest Service, does not mean in any way that we support what's going to happen. So that, in other words, they're saying, we repeat the word no. Now we have to say, you know, it would be better if, it would be better if. Very, very difficult. Uh, yes, in the back and then up here. Do, do they not have a permitting process and they can put... Wow. Wow. Oh. Wow. Yeah, it seems like a...
Yeah. Yeah. No, it seems to me the law. I'm not. I am not a lawyer. Um, but it seems to me the laws are woefully out of date here. Yeah. Uh, so here and then in back. Yeah. Does the Keystone XL pipeline fall in this no middle ground, no mediation area? Well, I yeah, probably it does. Probably it does. But I guess once the decision, if the decision is made um, to go ahead with it, then there could be some very serious talks about how it would be done, um, who, I don't know, all kinds of things. How, how, you know, timeline, safety issues, hiring practices. There, you could, you could, that you could work with. Right. Field trips are terrific, and we had many field trips at the Grand Canyon. Um, and and all kind. Of, whenever I can work in a field trip with the whole group together, I do that. It's especially valuable in balancing, kind of balancing power at the table. Um, uh, if I had a traditional community that was um, suffering from a Superfund site in southern Colorado, the Summitville mine uh, was a Superfund site, and the powers that be were the EPA and the state of Colorado were responsible for the cleanup. The company had fled to Canada. And so the, the, the power was really in the hands of those agencies. They said, you know, we can clean up to this level, but not that level, and, you know, take it or leave it. Um, the, the community was uh, really seriously without resources and felt they weren't being listened to. We took a field trip up to the Summitville mine and then drove slowly down the along the river, stopping, looking at sites, having a picnic, taught the community the community was in charge. It was their field trip, it was their it was their turf, it was their land, their culture, their history. And they, you know, that that really helped change, kind of shift a, a balance of power, at least for a certain period of time there. Um, another really good thing to do with a group that's starting to work together is to divide them into pairs. Um, it's a listening exercise. I did this recently with the um, um, Chickasaw Nation and the Park Service, who are uh, embroiled in some uh, issues about a common boundary. And although you know it was a rather formal beginning of a meeting, uh, and those two sides were lined up, I asked them to pair up a Park Service person and a Chickasaw Nation person in pairs, and they were kind of like. Who is this flaky woman from Santa Fe? <laughs> what, you know, we don't need icebreakers. We're here to do business, uh, which I am completely sympathetic with. But I said it's really important that we be able to listen to each other today. And this is just a way of practicing to listen. This is we're just going to, you know, I'm, uh, bear with me here. I promise we'll get down to business soon. So I broke them into pairs, and the instructions are, and you can do this with any topic you want. I said, think of. Uh, an early memory related to nature, because this was about land. And, um, and you will have four minutes, each person, to tell the other uh, that experience. However you want to, whatever you want to reveal, however you want to tell it. And then when I say time, you will switch. And the other person will do the telling, and the other one will do the listening. And it is, um, and, and the rule is that the listener, it's not a conversation, not at all. Not at all. The, the listener cannot speak. The listener can't say, oh, that's just terrible. It feels so bad for you. Or, oh, that happened to me too. Or, what do you mean by that? Or, not, nothing. There's no redirecting. There's no kind of bringing the focus back to yourself, which is what we love to do when we're listening. It is all, you're just, you're like that when you're, when you're doing the listening. Uh, it is a very powerful exercise. And that particular group was stunned by kind of where they were at the end of that exercise. We then debriefed it. You know, how did it feel to be to listen in that way? Wow, it was really hard. I felt stifled. I but I did hear more than I would have heard otherwise. And what did it feel like to speak? You know, well, gosh, I, to have someone's undivided attention, I I said a lot more than I thought I was going to say. Uh, so things came out. I then asked, does anybody want to share one of the stories about an early memory of being connected to nature? 
and three Park Service hands went up, and each of them said they wanted to tell the story that the tribal person had told. They didn't want to tell their own. They wanted to tell the one they'd heard. So we asked permission, would it be okay if so-and-so told your story? Yeah, it'd be okay. And it, that was very powerful. And the meeting went really well, and they got down to some basics um, that I didn't think I didn't think they'd go there. So if you can get away with it, that's a good one. Yeah. When there's an audience that they might want to grandstand to? Right, like FACA, right. Um, well, I think that's why there's so many work groups and subgroups and committees. <laughs> so that people, because we did have, in the Grand Canyon case, we did have um, small groups that went off and were able to be private. I'm not quite, I guess, because they took their results back to the big group in public. So that's the easiest, is to do it that way. Um, you can try, as I did, to kind of explain to the peanut gallery, it's rough on these guys to have all of you back there. Uh, you know, so please understand we're trying to make this as open and honest, as creative as possible. Uh, but that doesn't really help. I mean, there's no, there's just no getting around it. So I don't know what else to do except um, break into, allow them some privacy in smaller groups. Yeah. Go. Oh, it was, was there some, yes. Right, right. That's excellent. And of course, that's what it's all about, is getting down to the interests below the positions. So I do it quite deliberately and openly and, and um, allow people to go around and say whatever they want about their position slash interests, whatever. And, and then I begin to ask why. You know, well, it has to, you know, this, this uh, you know, we have to have such and such. And why is that? Well, the law says this. And which law is that? And what does it exactly say? Hmm, you know, is there a way around that? Why does that law apply? Or maybe that's not a very good example to use a law. But, you know, what what what, what is underneath? That's all you want to do is get what's underneath that, that tightly held position that you just don't want to give up. There's, there's some reason. There's some, you can do some, even some role playing if it's too hard for people to take their own position and get down under it. They're just, they just are too scared and they can't go there. You could do some role playing and give them, uh, give them a, 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 a really hard line position of some kind and let them play with what, a answering the question, why, why? Why and let them go down, um, but that's what it's all about. Yeah. Oops. I will. I'll be out there signing books and. Two thousand five to two thousand nine. Yeah. No problem. So I hope you all feel the same way as I do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.